I'm Jim Marine. I'm the Mayor of Muckleteo and also your Vice President for AWC. I want to thank you for joining us here in Kennewick and uh, look forward to seeing all of you in Spokane, which is going to be next year, uh, June 17th through the 20th, so just a little bit earlier than this year. And Spokane, if you've been there before uh, for an AWC, it's a, it's a great venue, so look forward to seeing you there. Also, uh, don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms that they were sent to you electronically, so uh, you don't have to try to find it anywhere other than in your email. And on behalf of AWC, I hope you enjoyed your time and that you all have a very safe journey home uh, when you uh, get to go home. Now let me introduce our speakers. We have a great panel this morning. We have Hillary Bricken, the attorney with Canna Law Group. The Canna is probably in cannabis. I'm assuming where that may have came from. Uh, she's regarded as one of Washington State's premier cannabis business attorneys. Hillary helps cannabis companies of all sizes with everything from corporate structure and intellectual property protection to branding, licensing, and medical cannabis law. Hillary's primary focus is helping cannabis businesses navigate the increasingly confusing and murky legal climate surrounding Washington State medical and recreational cannabis laws. Hillary was involved in the 280E tax form and routine, routine, yeah, yeah, the samples, routinely participates in community education um, panels to continue to inform industry participants about the current and changing cannabis laws in Washington State. She works closely with lobbyists in Olympia representing the Canvas Business Group and Business Trade Organization focused on the I-502 implementation. So that's Hillary. Uh, we also have Justin Norderhorn, the Enforcement Chief Liquor Control Board. There he is. Justin has served the Liquor Control Board for 15 years, starting his career as a liquor enforcement officer. He has 19 years of experience in the field of law enforcement and is a graduate of the Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command. Justin was appointed chief in 2011 and leads a staff of 77 commissioned law enforcement officers and 20 non-commissioned staff. Uh, also with him is Alan Rathbun. He is the licensing and regulation director for the Liquor Control Board. Alan's licensing division will be responsible for the processing and issuance of marijuana producer, producer, and retail licenses. The licensing division consists of 57 full-time employees, including licensing investigators, customer service staff, and an educated and outreach unit with additional staff added to process marijuana license applications. Alan was appointed director of licensing in 2007 and has over 30 years of experience as a regulator with the state. Scott Snyder. He's a senior attorney with Ogden Murphy Wallace. Scott has been representing public and private entities in matters involving difficult applications of public policy for over 25 years. He has served numerous communities in Washington State, including Muckleteo, and Missouri as our city attorney. He regularly consults with over a dozen Washington communities regarding issues of public policy and personnel. So thank you, Scott. And finally, certainly not least, Candace Bach. She is what we call our local marijuana expert on our legislative staff, and she is here to uh, maybe give updates and answer questions as well. So with that, I believe we're going to start with Scott Snyder. Scott, let's give him a hand. Always good to get applause up front. You never know what happens at the end. Um, I, I've, I'm going to go into a 12-step program. This is going to be the last presentation I make on this subject, um, starting with uh, a presentation in Spokane at AWC three years ago. This is about my 15th. And when the, you start listing your professional presentations and cannabis and marijuana are in each of them, I think it's time to find a new subject to talk about. Um, and what I'm going to do is sort of set the table for you. A lot of this I'm sure you already know, but talk with the re about the regulatory structure and how we end up in our current sort of schizophrenic situation that uh, the state of Washington is in at the, at the present time. And we always have to start with federal law. Under federal law, uh, cannabis and marijuana are a Schedule One drug. There is under federal law no medically authorized use or recognized use whatsoever, it is illegal. Um, no state may authorize a violation of federal law. Uh, this, the Controlled Substances Act supersedes state regulation of marijuana. States may decriminalize uh, behavior. Uh, basically, this is where uh, Prohibition and the Volstead Act broke down in the 30s. 
when the states refuse to uh, uh, prosecute uh, federal cases and the uh, burden fell on the federal government. Uh, federal grant monies, uh, as most of you are aware, um, the one thing that the federal government can do and does with regularity is tie federal dollars to compliance with federal requirements. The Drug-Free Workplace Act, Medicare uh, are two primary examples. State colleges and universities also have the same restrictions. Initiative 692, Washington voters uh, enacted a defense to allow qualifying patients with terminal or debilitating illnesses to get the, with the recommendation of a health care provider to have an affirmative defense to prosecution uh, for marijuana possession. And Senator Cole Wells, about three years ago, attempted to clean up that initiative. And at that time, and this, this is one of the ironies uh, that have developed over time, uh, state law enforcement officials, as part of that process, uh, got behind a um, concept of a collective garden. That is, 10 or more qualifying patients could have up to 15 plants to, uh, per patient to a maximum of 45. Um, I've, as I mentioned, I've had a, a large number of presentations. I've talked to maybe six, 7,000 growers and processors and potentially and distributors and law enforcement officials. I always ask this question, has anyone ever seen a collective garden? No one has ever raised their hand. Um, what we're talking about are rebranded uh, cannabis dispensaries that uh, sell product that is illegally grown, illegally transported um, as to uh, medical uh, marijuana patients, those with recommendations, qualified patients. Uh, the patients have a um, qualified defense against prosecution. The distribution points due to a, a Division Three Court of Appeals case have a, a defense in the uh, at one time. Uh, what happened at the state legislature uh, three years ago was that the state legislature amended the provisions regarding qualified uh, patients and the persons who qualified providers to indicate that a qualified provider could only serve one patient every 30 days. That killed the dispensary model. But what dispensaries did was to rebrand themselves as collective garden distribution points that have 10 patients at any one time. Uh, if you're curious how that works, talk to your police chief, but it's a basically a ever-changing pattern. Whoever the last person through the door is the tenth patient in your collective garden. I-502, uh, one which passed recently, you know, one aspect of almost every initiative is vagueness. Uh, they're vague because they're, they need to be put on the ballot, they need to appeal to a broad range of voters, detail to be filled in later. I-502 decriminalized the possession and distribution of less than one ounce of marijuana to persons over the age of 21. Um, and it also set up a state licensing process, which will be really the focus of our discussion here today. Here's a question for you. Of the 150 plus million dollars in revenue that the three state taxes are going to bring in, how much do state or do cities and counties get? There you go, and, and along with most of the problems from our, for on the ground uh, uh, enforcement. So, uh, is anything new for us? I don't think so. Um, in terms of local authority, uh, under 6951A, this is the medical cannabis section. Cities and cities, counties and towns can adopt and enforce zoning requirements health uh, business license requirements, health safety requirements, again, think building code, and business taxes. If your city has a B&O tax, it will be generally applicable to state licensed facilities at when, or when they come, uh, come into play here. But the, the big message here is we currently have two separate systems that are not integrated and are extremely dysfunctional and I would suggest counterproductive. 
Um, collective garden distribution points the, for medical cannabis. One, there's no legal supply state, uh, chain whatsoever. There's no state tax of any kind. Uh, no state licenses are required. It, with a health care recommendation, there's no age limit. So that 14-year-old with ADD can get a medical cannabis recommendation, although they've got to go in twice, not just once, to the uh, uh, health care provider. Uh, there are no state guidelines or regulation, um, but local zoning, public safety, and taxing authority is acknowledged. Now, I-502, what I tend to think of it as medical cannabis and recreational marijuana, processors, producers, and retailers are to be taxed with multiple 25% tax levels, a $1,000 application fee. Possession is limited to those over the age of 21, zero tolerance for 21 and under. Um, the state rules are being developed. Again, that'll be the focus of our discussion. Uh, local zoning. The Liquor Control Board's position, as I understand it, and I'll defer to the representatives, is that local zoning issues are between the applicants and the cities in which they reside, and that also applies to business licenses. Um, one of the reasons given, which I think is a very good one, is that otherwise the state would be involved through the administrative process in uh, in hearing and making quasi-judicial decisions on city local land use issues. And I think that's a very valid point that, we, that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I mean, I'd suggest that AWC, as you guys go forward, think about some policy recommendations supporting merger of the medical cannabis and recreational systems under I-502 regulatory constraints. Uh, while preserving local zoning authority and uh, confirming a local option to prohibit marijuana as, uh, as, as many cities are considering. Uh, I'll get back to this slide in a second. Um, Bob Mining from uh, Municipal Research Services Center and I exchanged some emails this week. Uh, while we represent a number of cities, I can't really speak for them in terms of regulatory options, but Bob and I came up with basically uh, a, a laundry list of what cities are doing, sort of medium to low risk options and then higher risk options. Uh, for, there are a number of cities that are saying no, and they're saying no either through a ban like the city of Kent's, which is currently at the state court of appeals, the Supreme Court uh, denied direct review and referred it to division one. Uh, the other approach, which is one that's uh, I think favored by one of the larger risk pools in the state is using a business license approach and not issuing business licenses to any business that can't comply with, with both state and federal law. A second set of approach uh, is the, what I think it was the half and half approach. A number of cities have enacted um, prohibitions against collective gardens under the 6951A regulatory uh, provision uh, while uh, permitting licensed state facilities, that is, when they're licensed. Uh, the, the third approach, general approach, is uh, interim or full-time zoning, designating zoning districts, perhaps lim more limited districts for marijuana-related uses. Uh, one approach that I'm working with the city of Issaquah on right now and their planning uh, department is merging the two. That is requiring that collective gardens utilize the same set of restrictions for, uh, that the state has imposed on recreational marijuana under I-502. The thousand foot distribution, signage requirements, basically have a level regulatory le playing field for what planners call bulk requirements within the communities. I'll close with uh, just some thoughts that came out of a meeting between a group of city attorneys that AWC sponsored and the State Liquor Control Board representatives a couple weeks ago. Um, zoning. Uh, my understanding is that the Liquor Control Board uh, intends to, um, well, again, notes that denying a license due to city zoning uh, would re require result in the uh, Liquor Control Board adjudicating local land use issues. They're going to leave those to you. Um, 
The coordination issue, uh, the Liquor Control Board indicated that they are considering sending local applicants to local jurisdictions prior to the submission of application to ask your community where they can locate. Uh, I suggest that that indicates the time for cities to move off of moratoriums and into either interim or, or regulatory zoning. Uh, tell people where they can locate. The now's the time if you want to have some say. Uh, on the list of options that I just gave you, note the one I didn't discuss was moratoriums. Uh, there may be cities that have just enacted moratoriums and are using a work plan and observing all procedural requirements. Uh, I'd suggest, though, that cities that have had moratoriums in effect for a considerable period of time, that is, don't have a work plan and have renewed those moratoriums, are getting dangerously close to the position the city of Seattle in was a few years ago uh, when they ended up losing a, a suit to the uh, adult entertainment industry uh, for multiple moratorium. So now's the time uh, to begin to look at interim zoning, have an answer. And lastly, I just note that um, the Court of Appeals will be reviewing the Kent ban issue. Uh, it, you know, it's not, we're not likely to have a decision on that for six months to a year. Given that the applications, as you'll hear, will be due in September 14th, uh, and will be acted on. Now's the time if your city wants to have a voice in where uh, uses could locate in your community. That is, you're not planning to say no. Now's the time to start looking at your zoning districts and get them laid out. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> All right, next up we have Hillary Bricken again, the attorney with the Law Group. Thank you. First of all, thanks to everybody for coming. I know that this particular topic has a tendency to draw a lot of interest, um, and it's much deserved, as now we have local, state, and federal law floating around, seemingly conflicting with each other. Maybe not. We'll see. But I was actually brought here today to talk about the industry perspective and the identity and the legal arguments of those folks that are on the other side of the V when litigation ensues and have taken part in multiple cases mainly on an administrative municipal level, sometimes getting into the Court of Appeals, sometimes not, on both land use and nuisance issues. So I tend to agree with Scott that this is probably moving into a land use area and the burden will fall on behalf of cities. And unfortunately, under Avenue 2, which is not the Liquor Control Board's fault, the initiative drafters neglected to give you any of those tax dollars. And I'm sure some of you may be thinking, well, that might be the biggest deal because what are the feds going to have to say about that? But mainly it was really brought in to talk about the conversations between the industry and you all that could be beneficial to both sides, examples of conversations already taken taking place and legal issues for cities and cannabis businesses, both medical and recreational, and finally to round out with the federal versus state law conflict. And I know Scott already gave the background on I-502, so I'll go ahead and spare you um, getting a little bit more particular. On May 16th, the Liquor Control Board dropped the pre-initial draft rules. It's four to six pages. They're very detailed. They're very comprehensive. Some ambiguities remain, so on July 3rd, they're very likely to issue a revised set or to adopt or deny some of the proposals that have been made, such as outdoor growing, um, and they're going to talk about production limitations or not. So if you are east of the Cascades, outdoor growing could be coming your way. This is another issue to take under advisement relative to your land use issues. But more generally, I would say regarding land use, you have to take a look at the initiative. There is a thousand foot buffer rule that's been implemented by the initiative writers. So we should analyze whether or not this will be enough. And in my opinion, it will not be enough. You've got to watch out for displacement, fair access, and consolidation. Will you be creating green light districts? Or will these places take residence in certain parts of the city, commercial, business, industrial, or otherwise? My clients are constantly asking me, where should I put my business? Because I'm starting to look now. Putting together an operational plan that's comprehensive, including employment manuals, security policies, and traceability guidelines is not going to take a short amount of time. So part of that equation is now looking for space. 
Our position has been and continues to be, you need to ask your city or your county or your town what they plan to do with 502. Now, respectfully, we know everybody's kind of waiting for that federal reaction, or maybe there's some fluctuation in the state rules that might affect your decisions going forward. But my first line of recommendation is to begin to have these dialogues and to not neglect industry perspective. What you want are the good actors, because there are so many bad ones out there, believe me, I know. Um, Scott's probably like you said, talked to about seven, 8,000 people. I've probably talked to about 12,000 people over the past four years, and I have not worked with every single one of them, as you can imagine. And you can't be everywhere at once. Um, the state's going to do a lot of the vetting process for you when these people submit their applications, but I think the last thing that both sides want on their hands is for somebody to move into an area where they should not be after they've invested all of that money in build-outs to only wind up in court at the end of the day or before your hearing examiner. So the 1,000-foot rule, will it be enough? I don't think it will be. Then your other two options, really, zoning and nuisance. We've seen some cities go this way. Tacoma has a nuisance ordinance, so does Everett. A lot of cities have already turned to land use for medical marijuana. Some of the issues that we see popping out of this litigation are that cities are zoning into very distinct portions of the city. Not a huge deal to my clientele, but it's not what's going to get them to file a lawsuit. The issue is that in some of these locations, landlords are not going to knowingly rent to these guys because of the federal threat, because of asset forfeiture. So when my clients see this, they come to me and they say, that was pretext. They knew what they were doing when they zoned that way. They put me in a very small area of town. I went to them and said, I tried to go to every landlord. The landlords won't rent to me. Can't you just open the buffer maybe a little bit to this analogous space? And they may or may not have a case. I don't know how a judge would view that. Obviously, it's factual based. But to keep that in mind with zoning, if you're going to consolidate, you might want to make sure that there's a modicum of access for at least one stakeholder. And with Scott's plan of merger, I would also be very careful because the medical marijuana community, believe it or not, does not like recreational marijuana for multiple reasons. It's brought scrutiny to their own industry, which was very needed, which makes the looser actors not so happy. It also creates a lot of competition for good high-end product. So when you're forcing them into these areas together, not that it's a big concern that they would litigate against each other, but you can imagine if you prioritize recreational rules over medical rules, the medical community might have something to say about that, just some food for thought. The other concerns are SEPA. I've heard a lot of people toss around SEPA. Um, <laughs> whether or not you know it, is anybody from Seattle in the room? Any Seattleites? Okay, so I can speak freely. I'm from Seattle, so I feel fine doing that. Um, Seattle has been this bastion of innovation for marijuana, for better or worse. We have over 160 dispensaries in the city. That is a lot. And in my opinion, most constituents have really gotten to capacity with that number because collective garden law is so fluid and it's subject to interpretation a thousand different ways. It's really questionable what some of these folks are doing. So Seattle took it upon themselves to adopt a zoning ordinance that in certain industrial portions of the city would allow for up to 50,000 square foot grows. If you can even imagine that. And I know when Scott says he's, said he hasn't seen Collective Garden, I know he's talking about these access point and retail storefronts. I have seen a Collective Garden. They are real. A lot of them are massive. Some of them are smaller. But these particular kinds of groves are massive demands on your power resources, and they can leave immense carbon footprints. They are not cheap to run. They are not cheap to secure. And I think this is one of the reasons why the LCB is looking and allowing for outdoor grows. But when you're making your zoning ordinances, you can't just take these retailers into account. You have to think about these growing facilities and processing facilities, which in some cases could be demanding of, of crazy amounts of space. Now, it's up to you if you want to allow that, because I don't think the Liquor Control Board is going to put spatial restrictions on commercial grows. So it's just another thing to think about. As far as nuisance ordinances go, I've actually found that these are probably more subject to attack than land use because they're so discretionary. 
Um, if you look at the case law, you look at who's being annoyed, how often, what frequency, is it the public, is it private? There are many inquiries you can make to attack that particular kind of ordinance. And my clients, believe me, they will try anything within legal reason. We try to keep them at bay, so just know I'm not being unreasonable. Um, and we're one of the few firms that actually won't take these cases if we think that they're losers. So I'm sure that some of the cities in the room I have been asked to sue and have been politely declining of that. Um, and if anybody's from Everett, I do think you guys did a good job on your nuisance ordinance this time around. Um, licensing. Many students' positions on licensing has been kind of precarious, mainly the arguments that I've seen in court and otherwise when I've talked to city councils or been on planning commission departments talking to licensing and taxation, is that if you give a license, it might be viewed by the federal government as an affirmative go-ahead to marijuana, which could be affecting on your funding, could be affecting on enforcement. I don't think licensing necessarily is the way to go. I think you can achieve the same thing through either land use or nuisance with conditional use permits, safety permitting. I don't necessarily think it has to be a license. But you still have to form your due diligence, I would think, if you want any of these actors in and out of your city. And I really do agree with Scott about finding your voice now as these things are materializing because some of these things with the Liquor Control Board we know are quite firm, which takes me into my next topic, which is the federal government. Nobody knows what they're going to do. Nobody has any idea. The only thing we really have to go off of are two memos that issued in 2009 from the Department of Justice. And if you haven't seen them yet, it's the Ogden memo and the Cole memo. I'm sure your city attorneys and prosecutors are well aware of these. They basically tell us that if an actor is in compliance with their state's own medical marijuana laws, that they become a lower enforcement priority. They become a lower enforcement target. However, that was with the Cole memo, the Ogden memo came out later and said that this is not the green light to begin proliferating the marijuana industry in these cities, counties, and towns. And as we all know, west of the Cascades, it's a different story versus east of the Cascades because of the U.S. prosecutors in control. So when I'm talking about outdoor growing and, uh, as Scott put it, the schizophrenic atmosphere that we're now in, we have no idea how the federal government is going to behave. And a lot of people think that in that stratosphere of enforcement, there really are mainly two targets. The state itself in court, in federal court, to strike down 502, and the stakeholders that take the risk. I've seen a lot of cities over the years back off and say, let the federal government come in. They want to enforce accordingly. It's up to them. We don't have the authority to do so. And I've seen other cities try to hedge their bets. That's entirely up to you, but I don't think the federal government is going to help our state out anytime soon with a formal pronouncement. If anything, I think we're going to see one of those ambiguous memos again. And just to close, I'll spare you um, until Q&A. As far as helpful advice going forward from an industry perspective, what I would love to see cities do with my clients, my good clients, are to begin dialogues when reasonably necessary. Don't waste your time if it's not going to be worth the effort. If you really think a major rule change is coming, tell my clients that. Keep them apprised of what's going on. I have many clients that call their city administrators, their county commissioners, and they say, what are you going to do? And if they say, well, we don't know, my client's immediate reaction is, can you keep me in the loop? Is there an email to serve? Is there going to be a citizens commission that I can be on the board? They want to give industry perspective. So I would suggest you at least entertain that at a minimum. Also, talking about industry perspective, try to get credible industry perspective. Um, at this point in my career, I know about Apple when I see one. I hope you all do as well. Um, I have lots of family businesses that come to me. Many retired businessmen and women that want to do this in their retirement. They mean well. They understand the law. They want to work with you. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to 502, they would much rather have you recommend them for a license than be objected to. And they, they really do want to be involved. They want to keep the community clean. They know the community, which makes them even more lucrative than their council or anybody else, in my opinion. And lastly, most importantly, what I would really like as we try to build this industry is for both sides to avoid litigation, believe it or not. I always wanted to be a litigator, but I don't do it as much anymore because I find community education much more useful to both sides. And that takes transparency. It takes being reasonable in accordance with communal needs. My clients are very much prepared to do that. And I also recommend to the crowd to really learn from your experiences with medical marijuana. 
because it really is truly a different animal than recreational use because it is the Wild West, I will be very blunt, no pun intended. It has been difficult to navigate, both at the local government level and with the state. So I suggest whatever you've learned from there, any threats of litigation or otherwise, to try to implement it with your I-502 discussions and to include industry perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. And next up we have Justin Nordhorn, the Enforcement Chief with Liquor Control Board. Well, thank you again for uh, having us out here. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you all. Um, we're just going to cover uh, a few points uh, in a presentation, both Alan and myself, and then we'll open it up to questions so uh, you don't have to uh, get bogged down in some of the things that you probably have heard in other presentations already that we've done across the state. So to start off, um, we'll cover a few key elements, key points, uh, some of our activities and timelines, and then touch base on the initial rules, which are uh, ever evolving at this particular point in time. So I do have a disclaimer for the day. Uh, so the presentation is designed to inform the audience uh, of the current status of the initiative uh, 502's implementation as timelines and challenges that we're facing, um, and as well as our next steps. But the views today uh, are represented by Alan and myself, uh, not necessarily that of uh, the three board members. Uh, we're part of the staff that are making recommendations to the board um, based on our, our research and experience and they're the final decision makers. So during the co course of the conversation today, something that we may say may not be the end result on the position that the Liquor Control Board takes. So uh, as you heard some of the key elements, so I'll just cover these very, very quickly. Um, this is a legalized system for recreational uh, marijuana uh, for those who are 21 years of age and older. Uh, we do hear a lot of issues that are still occurring out there with youth access. And so that's certainly a concern of the boards, uh, and that one of the reasons that uh, we're crafting the rules is also uh, not only the safety and security of the, the businesses, but also to uh, impact the public safety issues, such as youth access. Um, it decriminalizes it, again, for one ounce of, uh, uh, or less of usable marijuana, uh, as well as 16 ounces in solid form or 72 ounces in liquid form. And so we are going to be having some packaging and labeling uh, issues that come out, especially for the edible product and that sort of thing. Uh, it creates a three-tier system uh, that's similar to liquor laws, but not exactly the same, where we're going to have a, uh, a producer, processor, and retailer license, unlike the liquor laws where you can't have a vested interest in from one tier to the other. Uh, in this particular system, you can be a, a producer and a processor uh, at the same time, so you can, can't have the uh, two licenses, but the retailer has to be completely separate, which is unlike Colorado, uh, as a vertically integrated system, they can have the growers uh, be the sellers, similar to the collective garden type of uh, uh, approach that the medical marijuana industry uses uh, within our state. Uh, this is a separate, uh, the retailer has to be separate from the grower, um, and so that's built into the initiative. Uh, we also have the 25% tax at the three levels, and then uh, there is an opportunity to alleviate that if you hold uh, a processor and producer license at the same time. You don't have to tax yourself for doing both uh, uh, areas, but if you do transfer the product or sell that product to somebody else, there's going to be the, the tax issue. Also, the B&O taxes and state and low, um, uh, sales tax can be applied. Uh, and again, uh, as you probably have heard, the OFM estimates have been zero to two billion over five years. Um, we're really looking at uh, trying to take the standpoint right now, that zero number, so we don't uh, get overextended. Uh, there's no money coming into the state yet uh, from this, and we don't know exactly what that's going to look like as this uh, uh, rolls out. The public safety and education, um, there's some new DOI provisions in the uh, initiative uh, that creates a per se limit. Um, there's also, uh, there will be limiting on store locations and uh, advertising as well as the earmarks, as you heard, uh, local governments uh, didn't get any uh, dedicated uh, money out of the marijuana fund. Uh, and so this uh, is going towards the healthcare research and education. There's going to be a large chunk of, of money there. Uh, but I encourage you all to look at that um, and take a, uh, have some discussions around potential uh, legislative opportunities because I think we do recognize that there is a, an important element that you all 
have to play uh, a part in to make the recreational market successful, and part of that is the enforcement uh, for the other particular areas. So seeking out additional enforcement funds, I think it'll be uh, very important for folks to look at. So the initiative gives us a timeline uh, to have rules implemented by December 1st, and I'd like to stress the point that uh, we will have rules implemented by December 1st. They may not be the ever final rules. We've been in the liquor industry for 70 years and we're still modifying rules. So this isn't gonna be the be all end all on December 1st, but we're gonna have a very strong framework and foundation to get the marketplace moving uh, so we can have licenses in place. But that doesn't mean that there won't be any uh, need for tweaks and changes as this goes on or potential uh, legislative uh, changes that are introduced in the upcoming years uh, that we'll have to have some modifications for. So, what our objective is, is to create a tightly controlled and regulated marijuana market uh, for the recreational uh, use. It has a three-tier system. Uh, we're creating the licenses in the three different areas, and we're going to be enforcing the laws pertaining to licensees, and that's pretty much our primary focus. Our officers have the opportunity uh, to conduct uh, enforcement in around the license locations. Um, one of the things with I-502 that I'd like everybody to um, really be in tune with is it puts the Liquor Control Board into the Uniform Control Substance Act, which is under Title 6950. What it does not do, it does not put any authority for the Liquor Control Board to enforce any of the medical marijuana laws, which are under Title 6951A. So in order to be uh, effective as we move into uh, this regulated marketplace, if you're having issues with medical marijuana or illicit market activity, your uh, police departments will have to be the primary uh, enforcers on those particular areas. We don't have any opportunities to do that particular enforcement uh, for the medical marijuana. Now, I say that because we've started to track complaints already, and we are receiving complaints uh, across the state from citizens as well as uh, some local jurisdictions that are saying, can you help us out with this? And we don't have any legal authority to impact uh, any of the mar medical marijuana dispensaries. And so I would really stress that with your local law enforcement uh, that you have in your cities uh, to talk about their role and what they're going to be doing um, when it comes to uh, enforcement of the uh, uh, illicit or medical marijuana uh, areas. So the difference between the laws and rules, um, this is probably uh, redundant from what you've heard in the past, but again, uh, the law uh, it comes out of the initiative. Um, in this particular case, it will require a two-thirds vote uh, to have any changes in the first two years. And so the Liquor Control Board is really uh, in a position that we can only implement rules that are uh, prevalent to those particular statutes that have been passed. So when it says that there's a 25% tax, we can't change that. If it says that there's a thousand foot requirement away from the schools, playgrounds, uh, and the uh, other entities that are listed and detailed in the initiative, we can't change that. Um, we can't change the funding sources and, and uh, the application fees or the license fees. Uh, we get a lot of interest on, you need to allow for uh, on-site consumption. Uh, the initiative doesn't provide for those types of licenses. So we're only focusing on the three licenses that the RCW uh, has put forward in front of us, and we're going to create rules around those particular areas. So the rulemaking for the board is um, uh, we can add some restrictions, but it's mostly to clarify uh, the RCWs that are in place uh, and to implement the, uh, the initiative, not to change what the initiative writers had intended within the initiative. So in order to do that, we've created 11 teams across the board um, that uh, have been doing a lot of research. We've been learning a, a lot about marijuana. We've been talking to a lot of uh, industry members uh, and trying to get a handle on what does this product look like, what is it, how is it grown, uh, what types of security measures are needed, what types of access is needed. Uh, we have hired uh, an outside consultant, uh, which is Botech, who's verifying uh, uh, variety of information to include consumption levels in the state so we can have an idea of how much is uh, needed to be grown uh, and also how much is, uh, what type of access is needed across the state of Washington as far as the retail stores. And so when we look at some of these, uh, these areas, we really need to, to try to figure out um, how we can also deter from that illicit market, and that's one of the things that the initiative calls for us when our decision-making uh, occurs is to implement this 
controlled regulated market and also uh, be competitive with the illicit market and part of that is access and so when you're looking at this from a city standpoint uh, for those cities who want to say we don't want to have any licenses within the city um, and you create the moratoriums or you create the bans and, and you zone out some of these places uh, just keep in mind the impact the the from what we understand from the public comments that we've had in the the eight uh, forums that we had uh, across the state is the people who are currently in the industry aren't going to stop. Uh, they're not going to stop growing. They're not going to stop selling. There's a lot of interest to move over into the recreational market, but if we, there's no place to move to, uh, they will continue to operate in an illicit fashion uh, within the communities across the state. So that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're setting up the zoning. If it's too restrictive, uh, you may have another part of the industry to have to contend with versus the regulated industry. From the liquor board's perspective, when we're doing the regulation on liquor licensed businesses, uh, one of our key functions that we do with, uh, with the off-premise sales for uh, alcohol is compliance checks to ensure youth access. So we'll be uh, in these stores, uh, the re uh, retail outlets, uh, conducting checks, making sure that the product is uh, labeled and, uh, appropriately, that they're selling uh, legal product uh, for the state of Washington as well as uh, regulating and in ensuring uh, the youth access components. So and we can't do that uh, in the medical marijuana industry, nor can we do that in the illicit market industry. So that's something that, to keep in mind um, when we're looking at uh, establishing these locations across the state. And of course, we're going to be talking a lot with uh, Colorado, which we have been uh, over the last several months, as we're um, uh, both implementing the recreational market. Again, two different types of marketplaces. One's vertically integrated, one's horizontal. So they're not going to be exactly the same. But we're trying to learn from each other and, and what the challenges are that we're, we're both facing. So just to quickly uh, run down our timeline, we've done some initial uh, draft rules, and we, we put out some uh, pre-draft rules, if you will. So typically the way that the rulemaking works is we open up a, uh, a CR 101, it's called, um, uh, saying that we're going to be creating rules on this, and then we introduce rules with a CR 102. Um, and typically that's when the public comment comes in. This time what we did is we put out a set of pre-draft rules before the 102 uh, is coming out, which uh, is anticipated to come out next week. Uh, with some more formalized draft rules for comment. So we've taken a 30-day comment period. Uh, and one of the, the issues that we found is we had about 100 comments come in um, in general over that uh, first part of the month. And then the last day and a half, we had about 100 to 150 additional comments come in. So we had to sift through those. And, and so there's a lot of changes that have already been made with those draft rules. So I encourage people to, uh, to look for those uh, when they come out next week and, and provide comment as it goes into the 102. Um, and so as far as the uh, um, moving forward at this point, uh, if the 102 goes forward as it's uh, presented, then we should have some rules uh, in mid-September that would become effective and we could start accepting applications shortly thereafter and then of course we're mandated to have rulemaking completed uh, at least for the initial uh, portion by December 1st. So we, we have established there will be four uh, public comment, um, public hearings I should say. Uh, at the beginning of August I believe it's 6th, 7th and 8th uh, we're going to be uh, looking at um, Spokane, uh, Ellensburg, I believe North Seattle to Everett, somewhere in that particular area, and also the Olympia area. So there'll be four opportunities for folks to come in um, and provide public comment to those uh, draft rules. And so at this point, I'll turn it over to Alan for the rest of uh, um, our presentation before we open it up for questions. Thank you. Well, again, uh, thank you again for, uh, for inviting us here today. Uh, we've had several opportunities to, to be around the state and talk to several different audiences, and, and each one of these has been a, a learning experience as much for us, and uh, hopefully as it has been for the people that we've uh, had a chance to talk with. Um, and I did want to, uh, again, uh, kind of repeat something that Justin said. Uh, yes, we are going to have four uh, public hearings uh, scheduled in, in uh, in early, uh, early August. And again, the rules that will be coming out next week um, will be considerably more detailed than the ones that were initially uh, distributed. Uh, I don't think it, there are some changes that I think uh, Hillary has alluded to uh, relative to outdoor grows and things like that, which will be have, which have changed since then. But in large part, I don't think there's huge substantive changes, uh, but there's certainly more detail, and uh, it is going to be con uh, really to your advantage to take a look at those. Uh, but understand that once we file a CR 102, then public hearings are held in August. 
any substantive change to those rules as a result of any public input or that public hearing process will cause the board to have to refile CR 102 and then have another 30 day comment period and another public hearings. So, you know, all these timelines that we talked about before is with that caveat that this is an extremely transparent process and while well, we did our very best to accommodate those comments and, and review all the uh, comments that were received, uh, further changes down the road will kind of delay that timeline accordingly. So uh, again, and, and the real highlights that we're going to be talking about today are the real highlights that came out of our interim, uh, or our initial draft rules that were distributed back in, in May. So just to so understand, this does not reflect the rules that will be coming out next week. But in any, in any event, we are uh, anticipating a 30-day application window that will open for each of the license types, will open with the effective date uh, of the rules, um, and the board may uh, reopen or extend that time frame if it's deemed appropriate. Now, understand that you know, we're all guessing as to the number of applications. And, and in my division, in which we had to staff up in anticipation of the number of applications we're going to get, it's an extremely difficult thing to anticipate. Um, but it, and there is going to be an impact on local governments in the sense, as, as you might recall, this mimics very closely the liquor license process. And as you know, the liquor license process, one of the first things we do when we get an application in is notify local governments and ask them, do you object to either the location or the applicant? And so knowing that we're going to have a very large number of applications potentially coming in in the 30-day time window, that means the local government's going to be receiving a great number of these notices in a very short time frame. Uh, and you do have the ability to request an extension uh, to that 30 days. But that's one of the reasons that we have put out a listserv to our people. And you may have seen the top 10 things that people should be doing now if you're considering. And one of those things was, as, as each one of the speakers has talked about, is having those conversations with local government. So it's not going to be a surprise uh, when it comes uh, down the road. Um, again, the experience in Colorado, while they did not in, in any way try to limit the number of licensees, what they found was a great deal of churning in this environment, and they saw a 50% failure after 18 months of the number of people that originally got licensed. Uh, again, one of the things of controversy, but it's very one of the big differences between liquor licensing um, and, and the marijuana license groups that we've got is a, a three-month state residence requirement for all license types. Uh, it was a very distinct and deliberate uh, difference between liquor licensing and that of marijuana. We are going to be requiring um, a personal criminal history form from every applicant, as well as financiers. Uh, of people that wish to uh, get into this market and, and to help finance those. Mm -hmm. uh, fingerprinting of all potential licensees, and that fingerprint will go to, fingerprints will be submitted to Washington State Patrol and the FBI to get that sort of uh, background. Um, and as a liquor, we have uh, developed a proposed point system in which it is a discretionary point system, but it basically says if you have these sorts of criminal convictions, um, you'll probably not be authorized to get a license, but it is discretionary. Um, and, it, and it is, if we are to deny a license, it starts a due process. You know, it's, this is a property right, and if we are going to deny a property right, they are granted the right to a hearing before an administrative law judge and ultimately the board making that determination. But it is very similar to the liquor point system with a couple of exceptions, which, uh, and, and then this is again this issue of trying to move people out of perhaps an illicit market into the recreational market. We have made some accommodation for up to two misdemeanor convictions for possession within three years um, that won't be considered necessarily against them. So we have attempted to mitigate our point structure to, in this new, new marketplace. Um, uh, the next one is one that we have received a great deal of comment on in our comment period. Uh, but our proposed rules that, that we submitted before did require, um, or do re does require the, um, the submission of an affidavit by a landlord that they are aware of the sort of activity that will be going on in this location. 
But I will say that this is an area that received a great deal of comment um, from licensees and from landlords, interestingly enough, um, about whether or not this was the right thing to do. We are requiring the applicants to make a signed attestation that they are current on taxes owed, but understand current on taxes owed has to do with state taxes and not federal taxes. We are not, we are not requiring them to attest that they have filed federal income tax on, uh, you know, on, on their uh, previous history. The, um, again, the draft rules that were initially uh, put out really talked about operations and secure indoor grows or greenhouses, and this is a circumstance that we did receive a great deal of comment on, uh, as Hillary pointed out, not only in recognition of the Eastern Washington agricultural community, but also in, in recognition of the tremendous uh, carbon footprint uh, that results from indoor grows, and whether or not this is really the best, um, you know, to, to eliminate outdoor grows, whether or not that is truly what we want to do. So you will see that um, coming as well. You know, one of the biggest security features that really the, the board is instituting is very similar to an issue that, that uh, they dealt with in Colorado. And that is the federal government and others as well are concerned with uh, what the ultimate you know, outcome is of the product that's being grown and ultimately processed. We are in the process of, issue, we have issued or will be issuing a, a request for proposal for a traceability model, which is basically going to be a software package in which every licensee will have to, at, at a very young age, basically at a size of the plant, when the plant reaches some value, which is traditionally something around eight inches in height, which it actually has THC value to it, that it must be instituted into a traceability model. Each plant will be coded and it will be traced all the way through the system. And this is not undoable. It's kind of like food processing. I mean, if you, you know, the apple industry can, the apple industry can tell you when, if you've got some bad applesauce, what orchard it came from. So this is not an undoable process. It is something that's done in other industries and we're, uh, we're our plan is to be able to institute this in marijuana. But it is about uh, a very sophisticated process that will take into account, for instance, the weight loss due to drying. And that if you've got an inordinate uh, sort of weight loss that happens between a producer and a processor, for instance, uh, a little red flag will come up and say, you know, why? Well, we know what water loss will be. Why is the water loss too high? So it is a very sophisticated model that we're considering. Now, um, one of the things are the violation guidelines that, uh, uh, that will be, that are in rule. Again, it's a $2,500 administrative penalty for sales to a minor. That is the administrative penalty to the licensee. Understand that there is, that is still a felony for the person involved if it could be demonstrated that a person made that sale. So there are some issues that aren't addressed that, that felony um, laws of uh, the state and federal laws still apply. It is a uh, strict tiered system. Uh, and uh, that we have, again, very similar to our liquor system in which we classify violations. Uh, the one called Group on Public Safety Violations, the first violation, 10-day suspension or $2,500. Second violation, a 30-day suspension. And third violation is license cancellation. Again, security, um, we talked a little bit about the traceability model. Security. Um, the rules that will be coming out next week will have a little bit more detail about uh, the, the sorts of cameras and security systems that will be required as, as a minimum. Uh, but again, we are tried to, as much as possible, mimic uh, you know, what, what good things there were about Colorado's regulations of the medical marijuana industry. And it is similar to Colorado in that there is a requirement for video surveillance. And uh, there's also no, one of the things that Again, we're creating a marketplace in which there is no distribution network right now. There is one, but it's not that recognizable one that you've seen in liquor for the last 80 years. But you know, one of the things that, that was uh, brought up in several comments was this desire to have a third party transport, to be able to have a third party to transport product for between a processor and a retailer. But the initiative is pretty clear that the transportation really must be limited to licensees. So there is no third-party transport 
um, of product. Again, there are advertising restrictions in our rules. In addition to the types of advertising, the law actually restricts advertising within 1,000 feet of those, basically of those same entities for which the licenses are, are, um, you know, are limited, the same buffer zones. So that's just be aware of that. Um, and again, as we discussed, uh, location restrictions of retail stores um, we will be given notification um, to local authorities on all our license types. Um, and you know, one of the issues that we're getting ready to, uh, to talk a little bit more about is the um, number of retail locations. The only thing the initiative required us to do by number were the number of retail locations by county. And this is something that we asked our consultants to, to help us with. Now, the challenge that our consultants face is they can come up from statistically with a relatively good estimate of what the consumption is based on several factors of demographics. Um, but part of the challenge is knowing how much of that consumption will be coming to the marketplace that we are creating. How much will stay in the medical marijuana market? How much will stay in the illicit market? This is part of the challenge in coming up with consumption figures and numbers of stores, is that we honestly, through our consultants and the board, have to make some assumptions on what that is. And as time goes on, you actually may see more of it moving towards that recreational market, but to start out with, how much of it will? It's, it's a tough question to answer, it really is. Um, uh, again, relative to the, um, one of the things that I know is concerned to people that are used to the medical marijuana market, um, the, the 502 does not allow open containers uh, to be allowed in these uh, retail spaces, which from my understanding is, is a real disadvantage to some because they're used to people coming in and they want to smell the aroma of the product they're going to buy. Um, now, I, we, we also are looking at some alternatives here as to how we can, how we can accommodate that and yet meet, the, um, meet the, uh, the rules as it lays out in, in the initiative. We've, there's also some concern, especially in the area of edibles. One of, the, one of the areas in which the research we have seen is one of the challenges people have with edibles is the, the fact that the effects, unlike uh, smoke or marijuana, which takes effect Immediately, the edible uh, don't take effect for a period of time. It takes a while to go through the, your, your system. And so one of the things that we're, we are putting some limits on are the milligrams of THC per serving and per product, and also the labeling. It's, you know, part of this thing is going to be an education of the consumer as well, because they, this is, as we've often been told, this isn't your grandpa's marijuana anymore. This is a much more potent product than, than the ones that I remember when I was in college. Not that I ever used it. But. Um, I'm taking word for that. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll take your word for it. I won't talk about whether I inhaled or not. Um, strict packaging and labeling requirements are there, uh, including uh, THC and other cannabinoid concentrations, and usage warnings are, are included. Um, and again, uh, these are, these are all things that, that uh, are included in the rules, and I, I certainly encourage you to take a look at the new rules as they come out, because I think there will be a little bit more specifics. Uh, issues and challenges I think we've already been talked about. Uh, obviously, we still have federal uncertainty. Um, we still have uh, the concept of a, of a medical marijuana market, which for the, for the most part is non-regulated. I, I will say that uh, you know, the, the budget that has now been passed um, and I know that there is proviso language in the state budget that requires that the Liquor Board, along with the Department of Revenue and the Department of Health, give recommendations to the legislature by January of 2014 on uh, the potential regulation and, and perhaps taxation of the medical marijuana market. So this is an area that uh, that we have, uh, assuming that that, that uh, budget is signed by, uh, by the governor, we will be directed to, to come back 
uh, to the legislature with a proposal for 2014. Uh, again, uh, the banking issue, uh, I know of no resolution in the, in the short term for that. It's not something that, that we've really been uh, tasked with, uh, but we know that the Department of Financial Institutions and the State Treasury and others are, are again, trying to deal with this issue. And, and then the bottom line is uh, that we've had to consider in all our regulations is, um, will it be competitive? Uh, again, we've talked a little bit about, uh, we do have a listserv. If you don't have it, uh, if you're not a member, we encourage you to be. So any changes relative to our rules and everything else, you'll be notified if you're on that listserv. Uh, we've got uh, a substantial uh, uh, membership right now, and it's been, a, I think, a very effective uh, source of information for people. And with that, uh, we've already talked about where our next steps are. Um, the rules are s scheduled to be uh, put out on the 3rd of July, filed. Uh, you'll, you'll also see a notice of exactly when and where our public hearings will be held. And uh, once those rules are effective, we'll begin accepting applications. I may give you some inspiration on what you want to take into account in looking at your own local decisions. So a couple of areas to, to check out for resources. And maybe just to echo um, some things that Scott and Hillary said about um, having those conversations in your community now and, and trying to be prepared for these licensees coming forward. Um, this is a huge puzzle. There are a lot of pieces to it. We don't have all the pieces yet that you may feel like you need to make those decisions, but they're coming. And um, the rules, as, as Alan and Justin said, July 3rd, they're not likely to change significantly before going into place. Um, the thousand feet rule, that's, you know, that we, we do know about, and you can start to map that out in your communities and look at where uh, businesses may be able to locate. Um, the number of retail outlets that will be allowed, uh, that sh hopefully coming soon, as Alan said, from the Liquor Control Board, so that'll be an important piece of the puzzle that you'll have. We won't know what the feds are going to do, um, but I, I'm not sure that we can continue to wait for them to answer our questions. They're, they're just not, they're not there yet. Um, and then medical marijuana. Uh, as. Uh, Liquor Control Board, Alan said, there is the budget proviso. They're going to be directed to come up with a recommendation to the legislature uh, on how to harmonize those two things. It seems um, that there's a, a strong interest in the legislature in creating a state regulated system for medical marijuana and some, some level of taxation to level that playing field. Don't know what that'll look like. So, a lot of the pieces are in place, and I know this is a hard one for local communities to deal with, but I, I think it's, it's time to have those, if you haven't already had those conversations, time to do so in your communities. And then finally, I will just say that um, at AWC, we're definitely talking with legislators about the need to share those revenues. I think um, there's a sense uh, at the state level that their, their revenue is probably not going to be quite as high as maybe was once anticipated from this industry, uh, at least not initially. But I don't think that negates the, um, the legitimacy of sharing those re revenues with the local governments where the impacts truly are. So we'll be working on that in the future. Um, thanks for a few minutes to talk. And we have a great panel, so please, uh, your questions. And I don't think we have another, yes, we do have another mic, great. So we're gonna use this one to uh, go around, uh, use that one to go around and take your questions and uh, the panel, if you wanna direct it to one or just an open question and whichever one would like to answer it. Good morning, I'm Ron Lawson, City of Lacey, and I'm probably the only one in the room I know four years ago when I came to my first AWC conference, I was the only person that could stand up and say, I am a city councilman, and I'm also a cannabis patient. Point of clarification, marijuana and THC are both cannabis. I mean, marijuana and hemp, I'm sorry, misspoke, are both cannabis products. Uh, the uh, uh, medical marijuana community is very concerned about the taxation issue uh, because our focus is so much on people who have limited resources. Uh, many of our members have extremely debilitating diseases, other medications that they have to take in combination with marijuana 
and uh, HIV is the classic example. In order to eat, HIV patients have to have something that will allow them to keep food down. Marijuana does that very effectively. So we're really concerned about how you handle the taxation, and I want to mention that all of us are very appreciative of the work that you guys at the LCB are doing, Hillary, Scott, both, both of your uh, efforts are very much appreciated by those of us in the community. So I'm speaking out, encouraging as many cities as are willing to, uh, to take a, uh, not so much a wait and see attitude, but rather an approach that is a little more proactive and inclusive. Uh, talk to the, find out who in your community is active in this uh, activity. I can guarantee you, you've got them in every city. This is not something that's limited to some particular section of Washington State, even though the eastern half is a heck of a lot more restrictive than the western half. Uh, these are realities, and I think it's something that all of us have to take home to our uh, councils and to our staffs and to discuss openly in the mention of uh, inclusive, in, including uh, communications with the uh, operators who are going to be the providers, and, the, and I prefer to call them patient access centers, not dispensaries. Uh, we'd like to uh, respect the fact that the federal law doesn't think that marijuana has any medical use, so we want to stay away from dispensaries because that's connected to a drug outlet. Patient access centers, completely different tone. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to express these things. Well, I would like to thank you for being on our panel. Now we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. I'm uh, Dennis Higgins, City of Kent, mentioned earlier before, council member. I'm uh, in the three-person minority that opposed our moratorium. And uh, I'll just lay that out there. The moratorium was passed uh, prior to 502, and uh, you know I'm trying to figure out uh, what our costs have been to litigate that. And uh, you know my advice to the mayor, to the city attorney, to the four-person majority is that we cut our losses at this point. And uh, so I guess that's my question for the panel: Aren't we likely to lose? And uh, Aren't uh, moratoria in this uh, environment going to be thrown out? And uh, shouldn't we just uh, get with the program and uh, get some reasonable regulations and zoning uh, established? Well, let me uh, take the moratorium half. And uh, out of respect to your city attorney, I'll stay out of his business. Uh, I mean, your, your briefing has been excellent. Um, the, and the issues that you raise uh, in that case are going to be different uh, than uh, the general moratorium issue. Uh, my concern about moratoriums are cities with rolling moratoriums that have had moratoriums in effect and they're on their third or fourth iteration. There's no work plan in place. You're not actively working. I'd suggest those cities are in s really, it, it, they're out there. Uh, a city that has just, just stepped up to the plate, has a work plan, has hear hearings scheduled, are going to be in a lot better shape. But that relying on moratorium so, uh, I, is not going to be a defense if you happen to be the city in the barrel. Um, some, you know, somebody's, when, when Kent, at one extreme, is in court, and the city of Seattle at the other extreme is being sued in court, you can understand that in this area you can be sued for anything, anytime. Uh, but I'd suggest that those thoughtless, continually rolled over moratoriums are real trouble. Um, the, some others. Remember, too, that uh, you can enact interim zoning ordinances uh, with the same uh, basis as a moratorium, that is, with uh, after-the-fact public hearings. They can be good measures, particularly if you're a city that wants to direct um, to a zone. And let, let me slip one more dig in here to Hillary. Before, although we, we agree on fashion, uh, we, uh, uh, in terms of picking our outfits, uh, I, one thing I disagree uh, as a city attorney, and again, consult your city attorney, is that idea of pretextual zoning. Um, the underlying issue here is that no one is going to put a business model together, no one in their right mind, that uses their property to sell or grow marijuana because of the threat of federal forfeiture. 
you're, you're going to want to have the least amount of skin in the game, the least amount of dollars on the table. So you're going to want to lease property. And I'd suggest that a la the fact that a landlord chooses not to rent to somebody because they might have their property forfeited by the federal government isn't a local concern. This isn't adult entertainment. There's no constitutional right to grow and sell marijuana. Anyway, I, that's a case I'd like to have the, my, the city side of. And I'm going to follow up on that. Actually, I'm going to surprise everybody. I think the city of Kent would win in their lawsuit. I know, I know you're, you're shrugging your shoulders and giving me the furrow brow, but the truth is, with medical marijuana, because it is the product of a very aggressive line item veto, there's a lot of contradictions and inconsistencies in it. Cities are allowed to regulate in four distinct areas. It's business licensing, taxation, public health and safety, and zoning. And our legislature failed to include an exception saying, cities, you must accommodate these things. It's happening more and more and more. Kent is the most publicized one. Now, the policy arguments, yes, I think Kent made a big mistake, and I think it was a waste of money. But the legal arguments, in my opinion, are there for them to prevail. I'm also licensed in California. My clientele down there are in a nightmarish situation because their Supreme Court came down and said, cities have the option to ban, whether it's through one administrative mechanism or another, because the legislature failed to say, thou shalt not ban. And they know how to do that. Now, com compare and contrast that to 502, clearly 502, you're in danger if you try to ban. Uh, there have been cities, I know, from the 19th in the public record to the media, they asked if there could be an opt-out from 502. And the response, first of all, the very fact that they even asked the question shows that it's ambiguous, maybe. But the response from the LCB was, you have no choice to opt out under 502. So if can't really do the same thing again under 502, then I would say, yeah, you're probably going to lose. But with medical, because of poor legal drafting and a very aggressive line item veto, I actually think they would win. And I, I do disagree with Scott. Um, I have met many people, whether reasonable or otherwise, that are happy to use their own property for this particular type of cultivation because we're getting to the point that people are willing to take that risk with the federal government. So don't count them out because they could exist. And just one more thing. We talk about the side of time in my office relative to zoning. If you wait and you do not talk about zoning now and people start to move in, they get these landlord affidavits because they're cutting bills. We are convinced on some level that we could argue by analogy if blueberries are allowed to be sold in this particular part of town, what's to stop pot from also being sold there too as an agricultural product? I think a judge would entertain that. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you have a design, you might want to talk about it now, otherwise people are going to get creative. Let, let me keep agreeing as we I pass the microphone back. The change that uh, um, was referenced when I-502 was enacted it was enacted as, was referenced as a part of 6950, which has a preemption clause in it. So uh, that, that another argument. And I also agree about those cities who are doing nothing. If you, uh, I would suggest in most communities that you've got plenty of gardens, and that's a recognized uh, residential use, whether in your code or by history. Okay. So we have one, two, and then figure it out from there. <laughs> Hello, Chris Roberts, uh, City of Shoreline. We have several uh, current gardens and, and facilities, or however you want to call it, uh, in our city. Um, is there a sense that some of these facilities are going to transition into the 502 framework on their own at this point, or are they going to still stay as medical ma marijuana facilities? Well, I think, I think that that's a question for the liquor control board guys about where they're going to get their product and inventory. Uh, I guess the, sh the short answer is uh, we're not really sure at this point. So the open forums, there's a lot of interest from uh, folks who are engaging in the medical marijuana industry to come over to the recreational market. Uh, the challenge for a lot of those folks, I think, uh, is currently a lot of the, the folks that are doing that business are growing and selling their own product where the recreational market doesn't allow for that. Uh, the growers have to be separate from the retailers. So that could become a barrier for, for them, depending on their interest on where to get into the market. So I'm not really sure uh, what that looks like, but we have had a tremendous amount of interest from folks saying, we want to come into the recreational market. So I think there's an interest, and it depends on where their interest lies, whether it's in selling or growing. Did you have anything to add? 
from Congressman Fife. Uh, one of the questions that I have, uh, when we have new developments coming to town, we have some requirements for parks, we have some requirements for play areas, depending on the size of the development. As I understand the rules say right now, it has to be a publicly owned park. And the fact is, uh, homeowners associations are required to maintain these parks, so they're not really publicly owned. Is there any consideration to maybe changing that ruling? Uh, you know, I, I think right now our, the language around parks will, will stay the way it is, that they are really publicly funded. I, th I think uh, uh, it is ultimately going to be, you know, a, a policy call that if the board were to, to look at this differently, uh, but I, I know we have also heard uh, about local, about cities creating what they call parklets. And uh, you know, and these small parks around there, which which present a challenge. Um, I, uh, I I can't say that the board is going to um, look at changing that to try and accommodate, um, you know, what I would consider homeowner associated. Even though there's public access, it's not in the board sense. It's not a publicly owned and operated in the sense of of a tax. Uh, own an operated facility, so that's where the board's trying to draw the line. The other challenge that we have, just to let you know, because ultimately for a denial as being too close to one of these entities, um, we, we, the burden of proof is on the record control board to be able to demonstrate that it's a thousand feet from the perimeter of these things. So our biggest concern is where are the databases coming from and trying to establish a database for every park, uh, every school. Some of them are relatively easy, some of them are relatively difficult. So the concept of trying to locate you know, uh, what might be considered an outlet or a, uh, a neighborhood park that's owned and operated by a, um, a, a homeowners association will be nearly impossible. Remember that uh, if you get moving, you can still impose that as a zoning requirement within your community. You can expand the sites. That is, you, you have the right to designate the zones and to uh, put bulk requirements. So that, to me, is the sort of public health safety requirement that could be imposed. That is, creating an additional limitation. I made that a very similar comment to the State Liquor Control Board during the comment period about metropolitan park districts and those sort of homeowners associations that are required to be maintained and to maintain public access. But if the Liquor Control Board doesn't act, remember that that's also something you can do through your zoning re requirements. Hi, I'm Darren Wirtz from uh, Ridgefield City Council, and <clears throat> I'm trying to get up to speed on this, uh, or up to marijuana anyway. Um, the question that I had, as a city councilman, we are one of those that just kind of said, well, this looks like it's against federal law, and we don't want to go against the feds, so we'll just continue to wait until there's some kind of resolution, and that's good enough for me because I don't want to get, you know, crossways with the feds, are we going to be subject to uh, legal action by the state? And <laughs> uh, have no recourse to the feds then for state action? That's question one in my mind at this point. <clears throat> question two is uh, for the, the Liquor Control Board, you mentioned that, that the IRS uh, status, status of a business application was germane to um, liquor sales, but not to marijuana sales. Is that correct? If somebody comes in and wants a license, you don't look at whether or not their, their uh, <clears throat> income tax is current if they're marijuana versus you do if it's liquor. Is that? Do, do you actually look at whether or not they're in good standing with the, with their taxes if, 
for somebody with license for liquor sales? Okay, the, the first question relative to whether or not, you, you know, uh, your city is at risk from the state of Washington. I don't believe the state of Washington is going to be pursuing any action uh, based on a decision by, by, uh, by a city to, to potentially ban uh, because it's in violation of federal law. I think that's in not, you know, being one of the two non-attorneys on this panel, I would, I would guess that you're much more at risk uh, from an applicant, uh, you know, in, in that regard than you are from the state of Washington pursuing that. Um, relative to the, uh, the, the tax issue, one, we do not, we do not ask any liquor applicant their, um, relative to their uh, compliance with, with taxes. We, we haven't. The, what we have added in, in the marijuana field is an attestation that they have been compliant with, with uh, state and local taxes. And, and the reason being that there was a sense that a lot of these people are coming potentially from an illicit market. And from a standpoint of we know that there are people out there, and, and Hillary has told us about people that have tried their very best, you know, and do pay state and local taxes, it is, it is much more an issue of, of their personal and business integrity going forward. Uh, we have, but we, this is actually something in addition that we do not require of, of liquor applicants is any sort of attestation relative to tax payment. And just to add on to that about that first question about that state lawsuit, you got to have standing. And if there's no injury, there's, there's no standing fundamentally. And you're not going to be hurting the state if you pass some type of moratorium relative to I-502. Although I do agree with Alan, super insightful. Stakeholders are probably going to have something to say about it, um, especially if they've got a vested interest, they've got a location, they've invested in their business. Um, Secondary, relative to the threat of federal enforcement, just to clarify, um, I don't think I can name any case law or any city that's been threatened with, with federal prosecution. Um, and I'm really confident in that assumption and prediction going forward. Um, Jane Brewer, who is the governor of Arizona, her people also passed a medical marijuana law a couple years ago, and she actually sued for declaratory relief. She sued Eric Holder and the DOJ, and the DOJ came back in federal court on its own motion to dismiss and said, you have no standing to bring this. There's no real threat of federal prosecution. Implement the law. And they, of course, made a reservation that they're allowed to prosecute, but made it pretty clear it's not a realistic threat. And just a little footnote, the exhibits that they used to talk about a lack of federal threat were the letters from Jenny Durkin and Michael Olmsby to Christine Gregoire. So those letters were pretty aggressive, and the DOJ stood on top of those and said, but we're probably not going to do anything about it. It's a salient concern, but cities are not authorized to enforce federal law. And I know when we file lawsuits, that's pretty much the first allegation we make, and judges recognize that when we're talking about standing. So I would, I would just keep that in mind. I do apologize, we only have time for one more question, but hopefully uh, our panel will stick around for a few moments uh, afterwards. Also wanted to remind you, if you brought your flag uh, to the conference, it will be out by the registration desk. Hi. Hi. I'm Kathy Thompson with the uh, City of Buckley. And my question is, your list of uh, places around which there is a thousand foot setback, uh, schools, parks, transit centers, arcades, areas where children are present. Now, is this active schools or schools that are no longer functioning as schools, uh, but still owned by the school district and areas where tr children are present? What does that mean? Exactly. Okay, relative to schools, what we're going to be using is a database provided by the Superintendent of Public Instruction. So if Superintendent of Public Instruction has them listed as a, as a school that is operating, either primary or secondary, then we're going to recognize that as, as an area for which the buffer would exist. The concept of arcade is one of those elements of the initiative which is extremely difficult to, um, to define, uh, very honestly. But it is really, the concept is it's an, it's an arcade uh, that allows minors to be present. In other words, doesn't exclude minors. Um, so that's, 
that's about the best I can I can give you at this time. It's it's when we're trying to collect databases and trying to collect databases from people that like cities that actually have them, uh, or by uh, by NICS code or or SIC code, uh, you know, through uh, the Department of Revenue. Uh, this is one of those ones that kind of defies description. All right, and this is exactly the uh, the need and the power of AWC in this changing legislative legal initiative landscape. Uh, and so we want to thank our panel for being here today and, and shedding some light on this for us.